Hello, everybody. Thank you again for joining me. Uh, again, we're going to continue on through the book of Galatians, but I want you to know that at some point in this discussion, we're going to talk about how it can be a mistake to assume that everyone that you go to church with is born again. I, there's, there's, uh, there's more to unpack with that. So in a few minutes, we'll, we'll look at that topic together. I want to continue reading through chapter two of Galatians. Uh, this is a huge transition book where Paul is taking the Jews from their reliance on the law into understanding faith in Christ and what it means to be in Christ. And he always is referring to it as the mystery, mystery or the hidden the hidden gem that's in the Old Testament scripture. Now, I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but some of the things that, that God has put in the Old Testament are cryptic, and they're cryptic for a reason. Like we can look back now into the Old Testament and go, okay, that's referring to the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. You read Isaiah 53, for example, and we can see that. But if you're reading it back then, it's cryptic. Why? Because the devil is going to be used to put Jesus on the cross so he can't know what it's going to do when he is put on the cross, sheds his blood, put in the tomb, and comes back out. It's all hidden from him. So there's certain things that happen in the Old Testament that are cryptic even to us, and we can't understand it until we've come into the fullness of the Spirit. When the Holy Spirit starts to teach us, then the Word comes alive. If he doesn't teach us, it's just a book. It's just simply a book. It's got some stuff in it. In fact, a lot of people can treat the Bible just like Confucius say. It, it just, just little sayings, oh, this is good advice. This is cute. This is something I can put on a, on a three-by-five card to remember as advice. Or, um, you know, when I was in Bible school, they used the term pithy sayings in the book of Proverbs. Well, it may be a pithy saying, but it's the Word of God. And the Word of God has power, but I need the Holy Spirit to unlock that power. So let's read through Galatians uh, chapter 2, and I want to start at verse 14. I'm going to make a couple comments, read down that, and then I'll have some uh, comments at the end, and, and we'll put a wrap on that. So verse 14, this is Paul speaking, but what, when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, and he's talking about those people, the Jews, the Judaizers that had come uh, and, uh, and were eating with Peter, I said to Peter before them all, if you being a Jew live in the manner of Gentiles and not as the Jews, why do you compel Gentiles to live as Jews? Because Peter is following the traditional law of eating certain foods. And when the Jews aren't there, he's relaxed and just eating with the Gentiles. Why would he do that? Because in Acts 10 and 11, he recounts the vision that he had of the sheet coming down from heaven, full of animals, clean and unclean. And God said, you can eat anything. And, and Peter said, I, I can't touch that, Lord. I've never eaten anything that's unclean. And the Lord said, what I have made, don't call it unclean. So God removes the dietary laws. But this is, this is tough. This is burning in his heart. Um, I'll, give you, I'll give you a modern day example. You've been told your whole life you're supposed to go to church, and then God doesn't lead you to a church. Now what do you do? Because you're supposed to lead, follow the leading of the Holy Spirit, and all of a sudden God does something that doesn't compute to you. These are kinds of things that they can be tests. Are you really listening? Are you really listening to the voice of God and doing what he's asking you to do, even though it doesn't seem to make sense? When those things happen, now it's time to keep digging in the Word, to spend alone time with God, to practice hearing his voice and ask him questions and give him time to answer. You need, you need these things to be sorted through. Now, usually the, the type of situation that I'm talking to you about happens when you're later in life, when you've been walking with God for several years, and as you're following his leading, leading all of a sudden he takes a hard left turn, and it takes a minute to catch up. Like, what just happened to me? This isn't supposed to happen like this. But that's why... We practice spending time alone and being in the Word and being full of the Spirit so that we have sensitivity. When He moves, we move. You know, even in Acts 8, there's a, there's a revival that's happening in Jerusalem, and the Spirit of God calls Philip 
out of this revival into the wilderness. And he probably has no idea, why am I out there? And that's where he meets the Ethiopian eunuch and gives him the gospel using the, the uh, prophet Isaiah. And out of that is uh, he, he obeys God, moves from what looks like the big thing, goes out into the wilderness, and God uses him to get to one person, an influential person. Well, that has to happen for someone that has spent time and is sensitive to the voice of God. <clears throat> All right, back to uh, Galatians 2, verse 15. Now, Paul says, We who are Jews by nature, ethnic, racial Jews, and not sinners of the Gentiles, and he uses the term sinner referring to those who are not following the law. Those in the Old Testament setting, if you're not following the law, you're called a sinner. Knowing that a man, verse 16, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. That's a mouthful in that verse. This is the hidden truth. This is, this is the mystery that Paul's unraveling. <clears throat> Again, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law. And I've told you this, and I, I keep repeating this. Don't think of Old Testament salvation as obeying the law. That was never the case. Oh, Abraham was our example. Abraham obeyed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. That's how Old Testament salvation always has happened. It Forever, it is by faith. And, well, you say, well, then why should the law be given? If you look over at uh, chapter 3 of Galatians, verse 19, it says this. And we're gonna, we'll get into this more in the future, but I'm just going to read this now. What purpose, then, does the law serve? It was added because of transgressions. God gave the law so that they would clearly understand, when you do this, this is sin. Make it clear. Because remember, from the beginning of time, humanity is having a really hard time obeying God. Over and over and over, we keep moving away from him and falling into the trap of, of obeying the gods, obeying demonic principalities that have been set up. So the law was given in order to point out sin. That's it. But how does salvation come? from faith in Jesus. And the Old Testament saints were looking forward to the Messiah. We look back to what he's already accomplished. But you're not going to see salvation by doing anything. You don't earn points with God. Well, I went to church and I did some good stuff and I read a little bit. Sometimes in the back of the mind of someone who's lost, they think that I can earn my way. That's not the case. Verse 17, but if while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves are found sinners, is Christ therefore a minister of sin? Certainly not. So he's saying, but if while we seek to be justified by Christ, faith in him, we sin. We have faith in Christ, we receive salvation, and we sin. He's saying, is Christ ministering sin to us? No, no, he's not. Faith in Christ is where we gain life. Verse 18, for if I build again those things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. For I, through the law, died to the law that I might live to God. Verse 20 is one of those verses that you need to have circled, underlined, marked somehow. This, this is a powerful package right here. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me in the life which I now live in the flesh. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. There is so much that's loaded into this verse, but this is the turning point. It doesn't matter what you're doing. It's faith in him that, we've, that we receive life. We live as we trust him. How do you gain peace? You trust him and it's transferred to you. How do you, gain, how do you become righteous? The righteousness of Christ is transferred to you. Romans 3 says it's imputed to you. It's a gift. Can we understand that, what's actually happening? No, but we believe it. That's what's happening. When you have a born-again experience, you experience the change heart. There's a transformation that happens in your heart. And I'm telling you, the, the further I go down the line here, walking with God and talking to other people, the born-again experience is a mystery. You can't explain it. It's not by a formula. <clears throat> it has nothing to do with the formula. There is no formula that can get you into life with God. 
we just continue to seek him, and then something happens along the way. More on that in a second. So we have to live by faith in the Son of God. Everything is wrapped up in Jesus. Everything is wrapped up in him. There is no other path. There is no other way to God. You can't ignore Jesus. You can't say that Jesus isn't God and get to God. He is the way, the truth, and the life. You know, I can remember as a, as a younger man in the 80s, there were conferences about false religions and cults. You don't even hear about that anymore. No one ever uses the term false religion. Everything has been erased. Everything is being rubbed out. Our distinctives are being removed. And if you're a child of God, you cannot let that go. We're different because we have faith in Jesus. It, it, and when the born-again experience happens, you don't want to go backwards. You don't want to walk away from that. You, you feel a release in your soul. The burdens are lifted. You don't feel alone. You may not feel that every day, but you know something has happened to you that has changed. That's what it means to be born again. There's an exchange that happens. It's a mystery how that, that occurs. But the reason it happens is you have faith in who he is and what he's done and what he said. And, and along the way, as you pursue that, there isn't, there isn't a magic moment. It's like God is in charge of that transformation. He just says, keep seeking me with your whole heart. And if you do that, you're going to find me. You just do it till you, you, you can't quit. You can't walk away. You're not saying, well, there's a lot of different paths here. You know, which one am I going to choose? Will I have my friend Jesus or will I do Buddha or Confucius or, or the, the spirit of the universe, the universal spirit, or um, you name it. There, there is, it. Muhammad is not God the Father. Islam is not Christianity. They are not the same. They don't lead to the same spot. Salvation in Christ alone. That's it. It is exclusive. And if I change that message at all, I put people in peril. That's like standing on the side of the river and watching that huge uh, party barge, that, that big pontoon boat coming down the river, and those people are having a blast, and they're having a party, and they're enjoying themselves, and I'm standing on the banks of that river, and I know that it's the banks of the Niagara River, and I know where they're headed. So do I interrupt the party? Am I the bummer that tells them, you're all headed to destruction, or I just let them keep enjoying their life? I can't let them enjoy their life. I have to cry out. I have to tell them where they're headed. Somehow, when we communicate, it's Jesus alone. We have to be walking with God, walking in the Spirit, full of the Word, and His Spirit has to give us the right words at the, with the right timing and what to say and how to say it. I'm not saying you go in blasting with a sledgehammer on people, but we need to be able to communicate Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and there is no other way to the Father, and there is no other way to escape eternal damnation. There's no other way. Jesus is the only way that we can do this. Then last verse, I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. So let me make a couple comments here. First of all, we need to be able, if the Holy Spirit leads us, to address any issue according to the word of God. This starts with simply reading and obeying God's word. Paul in in Galatians was giving new revelation, but now it's been here for almost 2,000 years. So we need to be taken in the word so that we can apply it to whatever situation we get in the middle of. Right now, people are carrying anxiety, but Jesus is the way. He's our provider. He's our protector. He is the Prince of Peace. I draw on that. I, I have peace in my soul because of my connection with him. And then with all of the chaos that's happening around me, with all of the craziness, like five bucks a gallon for gas, what do I do now? There's an adjustment that I have to make, and I'm not going to make the adjustment on my own. I'm going to ask him. I want to know what his word says. I want to know what his spirit has to say about this, and I'm going to follow his lead. I'm not alone. I'm not a victim. I'm an overcomer. I'm the head and not the tail, above and not beneath, and I'm not going to be under the circumstances. And why do I say that? Because I've spent time in the Word, and it gives me confidence. I know who I am. I know what He's ready to provide, and I know that He's fed people before with birds. He'll take care of me. He will provide for me. 
but it's the word that I can use to apply it to those situations. We need to be able to do this with those who are unbelievers and with those who attend church. Look, if you're in a church or you're around other believers, you need to be able to explain your situations. You know, and the other thing is this. Don't assume that people that go to church with you are born again. That is one of the greatest mistakes that we make. Churches, in large part, are full of nice people. They're full of people, in some cases, they're searching for an answer. But you, if you think about it, and especially those of you who have gone to churches for a long period of time, you can think of people that you've been going to church with maybe for decades. You've never heard them pray. You've never heard them talk about God. You've never heard them talk about the Bible. They're just nice people, and they're there. That isn't a criticism. That's an evaluation. That's an observation. I'm saying now it's time to ask them, tell me about you and Jesus. Now, a few years ago, Connie and I were attending a church, a large church, and we were part of the prayer team. And in the lobby, big lobby, there we had an area where people could come and get their prayer requests answered. And uh, or they could have give us prayer requests, and we would pray for them right there. And I started to realize, man, I, this church, as big as it is, I don't even know if these people are born again or not. There's no way that they can. I mean, some people make estimates that only 10% of people that attend a church are actually born again. Uh, that may sound low to you, but once you start really talking to people, there's not a lot of understanding. So people would come up, and I remember the first time I realized this, a woman asked me, she, she said, I'd like you to pray for me. I have to go to the doctor this week, and I've got, I've got an issue with my knee. I'm not sure what's going to happen. I said, okay, I'm going to pray for you. But first of all, tell me about you and Jesus. And she looked at me with a completely blank look in her eyes, like, what? what? She, didn't even, she didn't even understand what I, what I meant, her and Jesus. She'd never, she didn't understand the personal contact with him. And the light went on with me. So Connie and I just began to talk to people. When we would pray for them, we always ask them, tell me about you and, you and Jesus. And we started leading people to the Lord. We started praying with them, and they, they started to understand some things. And um, it was incredible what we saw. Because we were living under the assumption that everybody in the church building was just like us, and we were wrong. And again, that doesn't mean that you look at people and go, they call themselves a Christian. Don't do that. That just, the, the critical judgmental spirit isn't, we don't have room for that. If they're there, there's something, there's something in them that's pulling them toward God. There's something there. <laughs> Even if it's just their wife that's pulling them, there's something. It's time to ask people questions. Tell me what you think. Tell me what you believe. Uh, and it's amazing how conversations can develop and they can they start asking questions. But I make myself available to take them to the Word, and if nothing else, I'm going to explain to them how to have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. <clears throat> to be justified is to be declared righteous. I don't know if you understand that word. To be justified, the just shall live by faith. To be called just yeah, you have to be called. You have to be declared righteous before God. All creation is shut up under sin. All of us. And I want to read a couple of verses here out of Romans, chapter three. This is a description of mankind. Start at verse nine. We have previously charged both Jews and Greeks that they are all under sin, as it is written. Now listen to these these words. There is none righteous. No, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. They have together become unprofitable. There is none who does good. No, not one. Their throat is an open tomb. With their tongues they have practiced deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways, and in the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. This is a description of humanity. And the word nice is not in the Bible. Nice doesn't get you to God. Nice doesn't make a connection just because you're a nice person. This is a matter of justice. We, our, our forefather, Adam, when he sinned, that was passed on to all of us. And at that point, we need a Savior. We can't do this on our own. There is no amount of good works that we can do because the good works that we think we're doing are coming out of a broken, corrupted heart. We are under the judgment of sin. We need a Savior, and we cannot, 
At that point, we cannot just depend on the good things that we've done. This is where, and I think God has to give you that urgency where you begin to say, okay, Lord, I need to see the world as you see it. First of all, I want you to tell me, what do you see when you look at me? Am I in line with you? And then secondly, what do you want me to do to help others connect with you? Some of us, we can't even describe certain things in the Bible to other people to tell them they need Jesus. This is where we spend time. You look for other people that are just hungry for the word. You start reading. Read some of the New Testament. Uh, read the Gospel of John. Read the book of Romans. Read Galatians. Read um, read First and Second Timothy. Read these passages where it's just talking about who God is and what he's done so that you can begin to get a handle and just pass on what you know. Whatever that is, just pass on to other people. You discover things and you you share with them. The Spirit of God will use your sincerity and simplicity to just give people the simple truth of his word. We must begin with our sinfulness if we're to receive salvation. We cannot do enough good works to earn salvation. We're under a death sentence, and only Jesus Christ can make salvation possible. One of the greatest things that's happening, you know, I mentioned to you, nobody talks about false religions anymore because we are under a worldwide pressure for all religions to come together. The one world religion, we're being squeezed into it. So what do you have to do? You have to remove the whole idea of sin. We're all okay. We're all okay. We're all going to be good. God loves us. We're all God's children, right? Well, that's not really true. Jesus was talking to the Pharisees, and he said, you are of your father, the devil. To be born again is to come into the family of God. You're not a part of the family of God until you're born again. Then God the Father becomes the Father. Up until then, before you're born again, he is God's sovereign Lord of all creation. He is your judge. But it's through the blood of Christ that we come into the family and again, that great exchange happens. We become born again. We become new. All things are passed away. All things become new. And we, we come into the family. We need the born again experience. And the pressure is on church. This, is, this has been coming through Bible schools and seminaries for decades. Removing the idea of sin. We're all okay. Let's just be nice to one another and love one another. Love, in some cases, has become a false god. God is just and he's righteous and we're not. And we need his righteousness passed on to us through the blood of Christ and his resurrection. And we get that through faith. We believe that he is who he said he is and he did what he said he did. And there becomes that, that moment of transition when we have a born again experience and now we're in the family. We cannot get to him until we admit that we're sinful, that we're lost, and we need a Savior. And he's ready for that. He's, he's got everything in place for the transition to happen. <clears throat> all, all paths don't lead to God. That's what I want you to remember today. All paths don't lead to God. And as you begin to deepen your faith, understand Jesus is the only way. Right now we need peace. Jesus is peace. He's the Prince of Peace. If you need more peace, you ask for it. Father, I need more peace. Fill my heart with your peace. Fill me with your spirit. Fill me with love and joy and peace and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and, and uh, meekness and, and long-suffering. Lord, I need to be able to, the days that we're heading into, you may need extra long-suffering. You may be able to put up under hard, harsh uh, situation for a period of time. The Spirit of God can give you what you need. <clears throat> he is the answer. He is the answer call out to him. So Father, I ask that you'd manifest yourself, pour out your spirit on these people, the hungry Lord, the hungry, create a hunger in the people that are your people, and then enable us, Lord, to communicate who Jesus is. We want to do this clearly and with power, anoint us with power so that we can speak and see lives transformed, Lord. I want to speak and have people drawn to you. I don't want them drawn to me, Lord. I want them drawn to you, to your heart, to your kingdom, and give an understanding. And I thank you, Father, for what you're doing in us and the great things that we're seeing now and are about to see. In Jesus' name, amen.